Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Blasphemy anger spreads to Asia as Pakistan protests turn deadly. Egypt's Copts and Muslims come together to denounce anti-Islam film. And over 300 officers charged in Turkey's sledgehammer coup plot. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. A BBC correspondent in Islamabad reported that medical sources confirmed the deaths of 16 people as well as the injury of 150 during protests today. Pakistani Prime Minister Raja Pervez Ashraf said that the offense to the Prophet Muhammad represents an insult to over one billion Muslims around the world. In the meantime, angry protests regarding the insulting film and drawings continued across Pakistan, with deaths and injuries reported. A Friday of anger in Pakistan due to what Pakistanis consider an insult to Islam and their prophet. This was the result of a film produced in the United States and drawings published in France. They took to the streets and burned the flags of the two countries and destroyed a great deal of private and public property. As they reached the compound of embassies in Islamabad, a large number of security and military personnel were dispatched and cellular communications were cut. The insulting film induced a response by the the country's prime minister, in which he warned that an insult to the Prophet Muhammad is considered an insult to Muslims worldwide. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is an educational example of the principles of forgiveness, peace and harmony of our great religion and is at the center of Muslim beliefs. An attack on the Prophet is an attack on the core of the beliefs of 1.5 billion Muslims. We request that the United Nations and other international organizations draft a law banning speech that aims to spread the seeds of hatred through these falsehoods. And the seeds of this part. In Peshawar, protests were marked with blood. People were killed and injured in movie theaters, and a number of cars and buildings were torched. As a result, authorities closed the roads leading to the American consulate and to the offices of Western relief agencies. Raul Pindi witnessed violent acts. Protesters hurled rocks and firebombs at police officers. These events pushed the government to ban violent protests and the carrying of weapons in Islamabad and its surrounding areas while permitting peaceful demonstrations. In the midst of intense security measures, demonstrations were organized after Friday prayers in several Islamic countries to protest the American film that insulted Islam, Innocence of Muslims, and the cartoon drawings insulting the Prophet Muhammad, which were published by a French magazine. In Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, a massive demonstration took place to protest the film that insulted Islam. Demonstrators carried a coffin on which they inscribed Obama's coffin. They later set it on fire while chanting, kill us, but do not direct insults at the Prophet Muhammad. A while later, they burned the French flag to protest a French magazine's publication of cartoon drawings and insulting Islam. In Indonesia, thousands of demonstrators took to the streets in various cities around the country. Demonstrators amassed in front of both the American and French embassies in the capital, Jakarta. In the midst of intense security measures, protesters carried placards denouncing the United States for what they described as insults to the Prophet. Protests also reached the Malaysian capital, Kuala Lumpur, where protesters carried a banner which read, insulting God's messenger does not fall under free speech. The protesters amassed in front of the American embassy as police tried to contain them. They carried a sign stating, Obama, our patience has its limits. In the Thai capital, Bangkok, police cordoned off the American embassy. Meanwhile, the president of the Muslim Students Association in Thailand asked the American administration to punish those responsible for producing the film that insulted Islam. 
In the Indian portion of the Kashmir region, an area in dispute with Pakistan, a student protest took place. Most of the demonstrators were female students who chanted slogans condemning the United States. They were carrying a placard calling for the execution of Sam Basili, who is suspected of producing the film Innocence of Muslims, which insults Islam and its prophet Muhammad. Prominent Egyptian Islamic and Coptic figures organized a mass public conference at the Journalist Syndicate in Cairo under the slogan, Victory for the Honorable Prophet. The attendees confirmed the need to bring the producers of the film that insulted Islam to trial. They stressed that the aim is to extinguish the flame that sparked the events, demanding that the United States hand over the suspects, who are wanted for trial in Egypt. Additionally, the observer for the Muslim Brotherhood group demanded the issuing of an international law criminalizing offenses to divine religions. At the headquarters of the journalists union in Cairo, it was an unusual day. There was a mass conference to avenge the Prophet Muhammad, God's peace and prayers be upon him, with the attendance of a multitude of Islamic preachers and Christian clergy, who announced their repudiation of actions aiming to harm Muslims, ignite strife and fabricate a civil war in Egypt. Why was it done specifically in the Egyptian dialect? Why was it produced by a Jew? We must understand the purpose of the film. It isn't to offend the Prophet, but to bring Egypt into a civil war. This is a message to the outside world. We're telling them that if the Western world makes anti-Semitic aggression a crime, it should make Zionism an equivalent crime. Therefore, a stand must be taken to allow religious symbols and religious holy sites to be safeguarded. The Egyptian Attorney General ordered the referral of seven accused individuals from the Coptic diaspora, as well as an American, to the criminal court and sent an official request asking the United States to hand them over to Egypt. However, the American response has yet to come which is what pushed the attendees to demand the acceleration of an international agreement that protects the symbols of the divine religions from intellectual extremism. You must issue an international treaty that forbids any offense to any of the holy sites we all respect. This is the duty of all international institutions. They will not respond because America has its own interests. It's wrong for America to include this issue under free expression. We are a signatory in an extradition agreement with America. Therefore, if we issue rulings, America is forced to hand them over. Angry reactions with regard to the film offending the Honorable Prophet are still ongoing. This is where a notable Islamic Coptic Egyptian alliance was displayed. They demanded the prosecution for those they call the producers of the crisis, at a time when Western attacks on Muslims continue. The French magazine Charlie Hebdo published pictures insulting the Prophet Muhammad, God's peace and prayers be upon him. This move reveals a systematic plan to provoke Muslims, or, as some say, the Zionist entity has become the main engine behind these works following the Arab Spring revolutions. Islam Abu al-Majd, Al-Alam, Cairo. A Turkish court is delivering its verdict on the case of 365 military officers accused of plotting to overthrow the government. So far, the court has sentenced three of the officers to life in prison. Several others have been given jail terms of up to 20 years, while 34 of the officers have been acquitted. The so-called sledgehammer trial revolves around a 2003 military seminar. Prosecutors say the seminar was part of a conspiracy to trigger a military coup and overthrow the government of Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The accused officers have denied the charges, saying the evidence against them was fabricated. The defendants insist the alleged plot was a routine military exercise. Also in the headlines, Bahraini protesters once again take to the streets of the capital, Manama. Come on. 
Reports say security forces fired at tear gas and rubber bullets at the demonstrators, but there have been no reports of any casualties yet. Bahrainis have been protesting against the ruling Al Khalifa regime for more than a year now. They want the downfall of the government and the release of all political prisoners. Scores have been killed in the government's crackdown on demonstrations. Just a few days ago, a 59-year-old man died after inhaling tear gas fired by security forces at his home. Saudi Arabia has been lending a hand to Bahrain in dealing with the dissent. Also in the news, analysts are accusing the Canadian government of applying a double standard in its Middle East policy. Activists doubt the government's sincerity when it says its Middle East policy is motivated by human rights concerns. A correspondent in Calgary, Joshua Blakeney, has more. Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, John Baird, claims that Canada's Middle East policy is motivated by human rights concerns and considerations of what is in the Canadian national interest. However, Baird's sincerity was brought into question this week with the announcement of a Canada-United Arab Emirates nuclear cooperation agreement. Critics draw attention to the fact that Canada is the world's biggest apologist for nuclear-armed Israel, and it is currently helping the undemocratic UAE develop its nuclear energy program, whilst concurrently getting outraged at Iran, a country which has a track record of being opposed to nuclear weapons and which is merely attempting to develop a civilian, peaceful nuclear energy program. Uh, a, a double standard. They're treating the UAE with one, with one tone and Iran with another. And um, so it, there's a lot more to this than what's on the surface. On July 31st, 2012, Amnesty International published a report condemning human rights violations in the UAE, in which they opined, political parties are not formally permitted in the UAE, political dissent is not readily tolerated, and restrictions on freedom of expression and association have been increasing in recent months. Um, the other thing that doesn't make any sense is um to label Iran as the issue with human rights when uh, this particular country, the UAE, does not actually have a great long-standing record of human rights. They uh, don't have women's equality. So we, we really do need to look at this and, um, and wonder, are, are we worried about human rights? Are we worried about uh, nuclear weapon programs? Are we worried about peace? What are our issues? In Saskatchewan, uranium uh, mining is huge. That's where the uranium came from for the Hiroshima bomb. Um, we've been at it for a long time. There's a select few companies that make a lot of money for, from it, and they have a lot of influence with uh, Stephen Harper's government. Many Canadians are left scratching their heads as they try to figure out why Iran is demonized by Canadian statesmen when it attempts to create a peaceful civilian nuclear program. Whilst at the same time, the UAE's regime is rewarded with Canadian uranium and nuclear expertise, which will bring the internationally condemned human rights violator one step away from developing nuclear weapons that could set the whole region ablaze. Syrian Information Minister Umran al zoabi denied that President Bashar al-Assad gave a special interview to an Egyptian newspaper. Meanwhile, shelling and clashes continue in several areas in Syria, and Friday's demonstrations were titled, The Messengers Beloved in Syria Are Being Slaughtered. The city of Aleppo and its countryside witnessed clashes between regime forces and opposition fighters in the surroundings of Hanano military barracks and the neighborhood of Arkub, as well as in the surroundings of the Ming military airport, as many neighborhoods in the city were subjected to shelling. Regime forces also shelled Duma in the countryside of Damascus and in the city of Al-Raqqa in the Al-Raqqa governorate, in addition to the city of Al-Rastan in Homs. And in the governorate of Al-Hasaka, a gunman assassinated Mohammed Wali, who was a member of the General Secretariat of the Kurdish Council, by opening fire on him in front of the local council, which is part of the National Kurdish Council. Officials announced that the appropriate authorities raided a residential apartment 
apartment in the neighborhood of Project 7 in Latakia and confiscated 30 kilograms of C4. The opposition National Coordination Committee for Democratic Change announced that it lost contact with two of its members. They are Dr. Abdul Aziz Akhair, head of its Foreign Relations Office, and Ayaz Ayash, a member of its Executive Committee, in addition to Meher Tahan, who was accompanying them. This happened when they were returning from Damascus International Airport after a delegation from the committee visited China. And under the banner, the messengers beloved in Syria are being slaughtered, anti-regime demonstrations came out in several areas across the country. Syrian Information Minister Omran al zobi denied that President Bashar al-Assad had given an interview to any Egyptian newspaper. He noted that al-Assad received an Egyptian delegation of journalists and that a personal chat took place between them, but it was not considered a press meeting. On the other hand, German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwell met with defected Syrian Prime Minister Riyad Hijab in the capital Berlin and asserted that his country will address the Syrian crisis at the upcoming UN General Assembly meeting in New York. He stressed the importance of agreeing on common ground for all parties in order to reach a political solution to the crisis. An Israeli soldier was killed and another wounded today when terrorists in the Sinai Peninsula opened fire on an IDF patrol in the Mount Sagi region midway between Gaza and Eilat. The fallen soldier has been identified as 20-year-old Netanel Yahalomi of Nof Ayalon. Three enemy gunmen were also killed during the heavy exchange of gunfire. Today's attack is the latest in a series of incidents along the Sinai border, which has become a hotbed for terrorists since the downfall of former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. According to an initial investigation, the three gunmen approached the border with Israel near the Karmit outpost south of Mount Sagi, where the border fence remains unfinished. The suspects, who were equipped with explosive belts, a rocket-propelled grenade, and rifles, opened fire on artillery corps soldiers who were guarding civilian contractors building the barrier. Troops from the joint male and female Karkal Battalion rushed to the scene and killed the gunmen, but not before the terrorists detonated a large explosive device. The IDF spokesman's unit has announced that the Army believes that the force has prevented a major terrorist attack from being launched within Israel and that the Army is investigating whether the terrorists originated from the Gaza Strip or belonged to the global jihad organization operating in the Sinai. The United States, Britain and France have warned Iran at the United Nations Security Council that time is running out for a negotiated settlement to a showdown over its disputed nuclear development program. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Susan Rice said that the international powers cannot pursue nuclear talks with Tehran indefinitely. And she stressed that the West will not engage in an endless process of negotiations that fails to produce results. Western members of the Security Council also blasted Iran for providing Syrian President Bashar al-Assad with weapons to help his efforts to crush the now 18-month uprising against his regime. Iran's arms exports to the murderous Assad regime in Syria are of particular concern. As a panel of experts has concluded, Syria is now the, quote, central party to illicit Iranian arms transfers, end quote. States in the region must therefore work together and redouble their efforts to deny, inspect, and seize illicit Iranian shipments, including transfers via air corridors, in line with the cargo inspection provisions of Security Council Resolution 1929. Mr. President, we also remain deeply concerned about Iran's stated support to the Assad regime in Syria and the evidence uncovered by the panel of experts to this committee in its June report on the supply of weaponry. This is unacceptable and it must stop. It is in stark contrast to the will of the Syrian people and a reminder of Iran's hypocrisy in claiming to support freedom in the Arab world. These concerns are aggravated by unsettling recent reports indicating that Iran is shipping arms to Syria under a humanitarian pretext. As a goodwill gesture, representatives of the Arab states convening at this week's annual meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna said that they refrained from targeting Israel with a resolution aimed at its assumed nuclear arsenal. Arab envoys said that the move came in support of wider efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons from the region. 
The step failed to garner praise from either Washington or Jerusalem, who criticized placement of the issue on the agenda in the first place. While addressing a debate called by Arab states over Israel's perceived nuclear capabilities, senior U.S. diplomat Robert Wood voiced Washington's firm commitment to a Middle East free of weapons of mass destruction, and he stressed that the use of IAEA meetings to single out Israel for censure would make it less likely to achieve that goal. Israel's IAEA representative Ehud Azulai also addressed the gathering, where he emphasized that it's not Israel that poses a threat to regional and the world communities. It is Iran which represents the greatest threat to peace and security in the Middle East and beyond. No words in this room could distort the real facts behind Iran's drive to nuclear weapons. Pointing an accusing finger towards Israel will not change this somber reality. The Islamic movement inside the Green Line, headed by Sheikh Ra'ed Salah, is holding the 17th annual festival called Al Aqsa is in Danger this evening. Thousands of Palestinians inside the Green Line are expected to participate in the festival. It is being held in support of the case of the Holy Al Aqsa in light of what Al Aqsa Mosque is being subjected to from Israeli violations. Calls are being made to turn its courtyards into public spaces, as well as calls to divide it. Excavations in the surroundings of the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque have not stopped. This is the latest excavation taking place at the Umayyad palaces, adjacent to the southern wall of the mosque. The occupation is looking for archaeological evidence of the Temple of Solomon. The search is continuing underground as well. Out of sight, tunnels are being dug that may have extended underneath Al-Aqsa. Muslims say that there are landslides, aged trees are falling in the courtyards and cracks are spreading in its seating and prayer areas, which prove that excavations are taking place. There are two goals. The first goal is to look for their ruins, if there are any. Until now, they haven't even found a stone to support their claims. The second goal is to demolish Al-Aqsa through twisted and hidden ways. Al-Aqsa is surrounded by biblical gardens, and the occupation's hands are extending out to its southern enclave, Silwan, which is witnessing expedited settlement projects that will eradicate its Arab and Islamic roots. The occupation has prepared plots to expand the yard of the Barak Wall, otherwise known to Jews as the Wailing Wall. From the Palestinians' perspective, all of this calls for forming a fact-finding committee of unbiased experts to discover what the occupation is destroying at the holy site. Al-Aqsa Mosque is sounding an alarm bell. It is calling on the Arab and Islamic world to urgently and immediately take action in order to save it and to pressure for an investigation committee that can look into the violations, breaches and dangers surrounding the holy Al-Aqsa Mosque. This settlement siege is not the only thing worrying Palestinians. There are Israeli calls to turn Al-Aqsa's courtyards into public areas for everyone to enter and for imposing a time division between Jews and Muslims to perform their prayers at Al-Aqsa. These calls accompany the daily indecent violations by foreign tourists and Jewish extremists, which do not take into account the holiness of the place or the feelings of the family of the Prophet. This raises the level of danger looming around the first Muslim Qibla and the third holiest site. Palestinians want Arabs and Muslims to point their compasses in this direction. They think that the Arab Spring distracts from Jerusalem and the Palestinians' case, which encourages the Israeli occupation to besiege Al-Aqsa and to tighten its grip on Jerusalem. Elias Karam, Al Jazeera, occupied Jerusalem. After a report from the World Bank was released yesterday, the International Monetary Fund said that the Palestinian economy is facing serious risks with declining growth and increasing unemployment in both the northern and southern governorates. The report covers the Palestinian National Authority's financial performance during the current year and will be presented at a meeting of donor countries, scheduled to be held in New York on the 23rd of the month. In the report, the fund added that the recent severe decline in funding for the Palestinian National Authority 
led to difficulties paying overdue local debts to commercial banks. The fund called for implementing joint arrangements between the National Authority and Tel Aviv to raise clearance revenue, which should be implemented promptly to support fiscal adjustment efforts. The fund also called on the Palestinian National Authority in Israel, in addition to the international community, to take expedited measures in order to limit the risks of the continuing economic slowdown, the increase in unemployment rates, and the financial crisis itself, which will lead to a fueling of social tensions. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad said that the Palestinian National Authority is exerting all efforts to strengthen the citizens' resilience and to overcome the crisis it is facing. And during the graduation ceremony for the participants of the training programs that were organized by the Ministry of Social Affairs, he added that the authority is very confident about overcoming this crisis. First, we will intensify our efforts to provide sufficient funding and aid through donors during their meeting in New York in order to transfer what was agreed upon in aid pledged to the Palestinian National Authority. For two years, the amount of aid received was less than that needed to balance the Palestinian National Authority's budget, which led to a suffocating financial crisis. On the other hand, the Palestinian National Authority is intensifying its efforts aimed at strengthening our ability to improve revenue and to improve the proceeds of this revenue, including tax proceeds, and also to make additional improvements to the management by unifying it. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.